trust that you would uh, be edified by we've got some questions that we're going to uh, be dealing with and uh, and answering uh, hopefully over the years so we pray that you just would be encouraged just again just to endure the, uh, the word of God as always anytime we, uh, we gather together it's always with the point that we want to pray and uh, we've got several members that we want to be praying for and just asking again God's continued blessings upon them who are uh, going through seasons of difficulty and so on. Let's pause for just a moment and we'll go to God in prayer and then we'll get started with our, uh, our Q&A for this morning. Father, how we love you and how we thank you again for being God, for being gracious, for being good, for uh, loving us just beyond our ability to fully comprehend at times. We we thank you most of all for that uh, demonstration of your love, your grace, your mercy uh, fulfilled in your person of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you for Jesus, and we thank you, God, that he came and he lived, he died, he was buried, he was resurrected, he ascended, and now he's sitting on your right hand. And we thank you, God, that he sent us your Holy Spirit uh, so that we would know how to live in this life with the challenges that we face knowing how to live a life that is fit for the church in which you have made us a part of. You chose us, the Bible would say, before the foundation of the world, and for that we are most thankful and extremely grateful to you. Uh, as we come this morning, Lord, we pray, uh, as is always, uh, interceding on behalf of our brothers and our sisters. You know you know about Carolyn Ben and her ongoing battle for strength since November 17, and uh, God, we, uh, we know that you're a great God. We know you got all power. We know you can do all things. We thank you for sustaining her, uh, for maintaining her in the midst of all that she's gone through. We thank you for Horace, and we've seen the demonstration of a husband who, who loves in the rich office poor in sickness and in health, uh, a husband who's forsaken all others and stuck only unto his wife uh, because she is still yet living. So we thank you, God, uh, for Horace Ben. We pray yes, uh, for our own brother Clyde Berry, who is um, going through a bit of a time right now. Uh, doctors have uh, wanted to do tests and the like on him. God, we know you're the healer. We know you are the great physician, so we ask right now, Lord, that you would allow whatever this test may be, that you would fix, uh, fix him because you have wonderfully and fearfully made him, and so we ask that you would fix what's not right in his body right now, because, Lord, we do know you have that kind of power, and uh, we know you're a great and awesome God. We, uh, we pray for Demaria, uh, Zoya's granddaughter, Father, that you would touch her body uh, the only way that you can. You know her heart. You know her mind. Uh, she is fearfully and wonderfully made by you, Father, so we know you are able to heal and we know you're able to uh, uh, strengthen. We know you're able to turn it all around. Uh, God, we know you have just that kind of power, so we certainly entrust the Maria uh, to you, Lord. Uh, families that are just going through seasons of death and disease and sickness and illness we lift all of them before you and always again begging your mercy uh begging lord for your your kindness that you always demonstrate and knowing lord we can never command you to do anything but we shall know how to ask you and we ask lord humbly we ask lord reverently we ask lord respectfully uh knowing ultimately that uh, whatever we do whatever we say it's all up to you anyway and so we entrust you with our lives, we entrust you uh, with our circumstances, we entrust you with our situations. One thing we know, the Bible clearly says to us that you have not given us spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. Mm -hmm. uh, that power, Lord, Lord, we know resides in us. Uh, we know that power lives in us, and so help us to always to activate that power, that power that says no matter what comes up, you can handle it. That power that says no matter what you allow us to go in, you can bring us out. That power that says that even if we die, you got the power to raise us up. 
And so, Lord, we entrust that power. We believe in that power. We rely on that power and then of a sound mind. Uh, God, we know there's a lot of things that the people are being said, but we count on your word. We count on your will. We count on your way that gives us soundness, that gives us stability, that helps us to know regardless of how difficult the circumstances of life may be, you got us because you are our father and we are your children. We rely totally on you, depend totally on you. Uh, because there's no one else who can do what you do. So, Lord, for every member of our church, from Sister Philomena Thomas to the baby yet in uh, Tanisha's belly, God, we pray that you will continue to keep us as a church family. We pray for every church, Lord, uh, of Jesus Christ, all over the seven, eight con seven continents of the world. We pray, God, that wherever people are gathering, uh, that they're remembering again that you're God and you're worthy of all glory, you're worthy of all honor, and you are worthy of all praise. We thank you now for this opportunity uh, to be able to share your word in this capacity. We do pray for Brother Sean Aguilar. We pray, God, that you would give us the answers to the questions that people are already asking. And for those that uh, will call in or uh, send an email, with a, a text, whatever they may do, God, just open our hearts and our minds so that we can rightly divide your word mm -hmm. and give the answer that, that, that ultimately is what you said. Uh, we clearly know that whatever we say is not of any private interpretation. It's what you said. So, Lord, whatever answers we get, I pray that you would touch the hearts of your people, that they would not debate nor delay, nor want to have a lot of discussion about what you said. But, Lord, not just to be hearers of your word, but to be doers of your word. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in and through us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we've got a couple of uh, uh, avenues that we're going by. Uh, there are several questions that have already been sent in to us. Uh, I'm going to ask Sean, if he will, to maybe go ahead and start with the first question, if he's ready. First question, um, absolutely. We had the uh, first question that asked us, according to, y'all going to put it up on the screen, guys? We got a lot going on right now, y'all, so y'all know, most of y'all know, I am not, I am not digitally literate, <laughs> computer literate, and all of that kind of thing. So, so I'm just going to be me in this thing, <laughs> but promise <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna get through it. We're gonna work through it. Sean is uh, uh, is gonna give some guidance to me uh, in terms of how to deal with all of the digital things that we're de dealing with. But but just in case you can't see it, here's the question: According to Psalms 139, 21 and 22, and also Psalm 140, verse 10, is there ever a time when we have the right to ask God? to do something bad to our enemies. I like that question. I like that question. John, what, what a <laughs> Sure, absolutely. Well, first, um, let's take a look at Psalms 139 uh, and 140 just for context. Um, Psalm 139, verse uh, 21 and 22, uh, I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard Bible that I have in front of me. And it says on this fashion, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemy. Mm. That's in Psalm 139. There's another verse that's asked in the question. It's 140 and verse 10. Just uh, maybe on the next page here. It says, Psalm 140, verse 10. May burning coals fall upon them. <laughs> May they be cast into the fire, into yeah, yeah. deep pits from which they cannot rise. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> Psalm 139 and Psalm 140, these particular passages, they're called imprecatory psalms. And so <clears throat> imprecatory psalms have to be handled very carefully in the sense of a New Testament believer. And so because you have to figure out, well, how do I, how do I um, justify this with love your enemies? Yeah. How do I reconcile what I see here in imprecatory yes. psalms yes. with love your enemies. Yes. Well, here's the deal, is that when David is um, writing these psalms, he's aligning himself with what God has already said that he will do to his enemies. Mm -hmm. He's not asking God to do anything new, mm -hmm. um, and it's not contained just to his time period. So the danger that we have to avoid is trying to apply an imprecatory psalm 
specifically to someone that's doing something to us here on earth in our time. Amen. And so, because you pray an imprec you, you pray an imprecation every time you pray the Lord's Prayer. Because as soon as you say, Thy kingdom come, you are recognizing and hoping for the return of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, that will be for non believers judgment. Mm -hmm. So judgment is going to happen in in the final order of things. So the 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 part to make sure that we're careful with is not trying to curse someone for something that they did specifically at our time and and and, and place in history. Amen. That it's hey, I mean cuz that's where you're getting into a voodoo doll type of theology where it's like hey, I'm going to I want someone to to be hurt because they hurt me. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's where on earth we need to love our enemies, but at the same time we know the truth that there is going to be a final judgment for those um, that believe in Christ. They will have they will be judged according to the works of Christ, and those that do not, they will be judged according to their works. You know, it's very simple. So I think it's just keeping it into the context of understanding our frustration with things that happen in life. And that's what David's doing here in these Psalms. He's expressing his frustration and God understands that frustration. That's good. But we ought not to pray that something bad happen to someone because they did something bad to us. Excellent, excellent. You know, and, and David was able to actually identify who his enemies were mm -hmm. uh, in those days. The, these were idol worshipers for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so that was clear in terms of if, if an individual was serving an, another God, automatically David looked at that individual as an enemy of God. Mm -hmm. So therefore, for him to pray that was not out, out of line with what God said. Now, I mm -hmm. want you all to keep in mind, Sean did say it, but I want us to read it uh, for our own edification. In Matthew chapter 5, this is what he says to us. And I'm starting at verse 43. He says, you have heard that it has been said, you shall love your neighbor and watch and hate your enemy. Mm -hmm. It's been said. Mm -hmm. It's been read. It's been it's understood that 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 precatory that precatory prayer that David prayed was in line with the will of God. All right, mm -hmm. uh, but now he's talking about the Pharisees and the way they handled the word of God. And notice what he says: "But I say to you, love your enemies, mm -hmm. bless those who curse you, mm -hmm. do good to those who hate you." So, if you really want to know how we're to handle our enemies, rather than praying on them, praying about them. Here's what the word of God says. He says, uh, do good to those who hate you. Yes. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. For he, why? He makes his sun rise on the just as well as the, mm -hmm. the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those, notice what he says, mm -hmm. who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect. Whoa. You shall. <laughs> yeah. And that messes a whole lot of us oh, up yeah. because what we would like to do, we would like to give our enemies a good old gospel soup bone. We just like <laughs> to hit them upside the head. And we would like God just to rain down fire on them, all of that sort of thing. But Jesus is saying what he's doing is laying out, uh, uh, again, what God's real intentions were, uh, establishing what, what the kingdom of God uh, on, on earth, uh, as, as Sean said, your kingdom come, your will be done. We know ultimately that is going to come a time that the enemies are going to be dealt with. But he does say this other thing to us uh, in Romans chapter 12. Sean, you know mm -hmm. where I'm going. Mm -hmm. Romans mm -hmm. chapter 12. He deals with that whole issue of, you know, what are you to do when you're dealing with an enemy? Notice what he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Uh, Repay no one evil for evil. Mm -hmm. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depend on you, live peaceably with all mm -hmm. men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is what? Mine, mm -hmm. said the Lord. I will repay. Uh, therefore, if your enemy, ooh -wee, if your enemy is hungry, mm -hmm. do what? Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. 
For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but what overcome evil with good. I know some of y'all want to tear that page out your Bible. Like, <laughs> man, let's just take that out. That We don't want that in there. But no, this is what God is saying to us from a practical standpoint. This is what you and I can do when it comes to the issue of dealing with an enemy. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question was, does God harden our hearts? Uh, and is, and, he, and is, he, is he the only one who can unharden our hearts? I'm in the book of Romans chapter 12. Go to Romans chapter 10. Go to Romans chapter 10 in your Bible. Um, it gives a wonderful uh, il illustration of that. Uh, Sean is going to be dealing with the, uh, the next question. But Romans chapter 10, wonderful way that God's placed it. Because what he is mm -hmm. dealing with, the issue of election, his sovereign election. In other words, God is so in control of his creation that God can choose whomever he wants to do whatever he wants to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, we know Satan, Satan is a bad dude. He, I mean, he is, Satan is a bad dude. There's no doubt about it. He knows how to create havoc and cause problems and division and steal, kill. He, he can do all of that kind of thing. However, <clears throat> we go to the book of Job where we recognize he can't do anything unless God allows him to do it, right? So that says everything that God creates, we've got to keep that in mind. Everything God created, he controls. That's your boss on your job. That's your difficult boo. Um, that's your dog. That's your cat. That's your, your house. Whatever God created, God controls. And you've got to keep that in mind. He says it in a, a Romans chapter 10, verse 14. He says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but watch this, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this purpose I have raised you up, that you may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, listen to the language. God, he has mercy on whom he wills, mm -hmm. and whom he wills, he hardens. So the answer to that question is, does God harden our hearts, and is he the only one who can unharden our hearts? Yes, mm -hmm. he's the only one. He, mm -hmm. he is the only one. Understand that all of us, when we came into the world, all of our hearts were hardened toward God. Mm -hmm. And unless God, according to Matt, uh, uh, Acts chapter 16, uh, like he did again with the first European convert, unless God opens up our heart, we stay hard-hearted, mean, cantankerous, unkind, unloving. We still will do all of those things. So the only one that has the power to harden a heart, the only one that has the power to unharden a heart, you absolutely correct, is God. Amen. Look at number three. Here's the, here's the, uh, the, the question that we have. Uh, was Adam and Eve saved from their sin? Wow, was Adam oh, and Eve saved from their shod, sin? Oh, yeah. shod, shod, So, so <laughs> Adam and Eve saved from their sin. So this is one where um, there's no hard and fast, clear verse wow. in the Bible that says, and Adam was saved. It and doesn't was saved. tell us that. It, it doesn't, doesn't say, say that. So I can't give it. you. I can't give you a, okay. a, a, a precise book, chapter, okay. verse. However, I think that we can systematically put a few things together that can give us okay. the most likely answer. So okay. if you would uh, turn to, to Genesis uh, chapter three. That's Genesis it. Genesis chapter three. That's it. And um, I'm going to twenty twenty one. Twenty one. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to 2021. 20, and so in the New King James Version, uh, it says, Also Adam and his wife, the Lord God, made tunics of skin mm -hmm. and clothed them. Yeah. Okay? And so we obviously have come just off the fall. And then after the fall, there is the proto-evangelion. There yeah. is the, the first gospel, and that's in verse 15. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that is, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Mm -hmm. And so this is the, the prophecy of a coming Messiah already here in Genesis. Mm -hmm. So what we see is that uh, man is in a fallen state. 
And then now in verse uh, 21, that God has made uh, a sacrifice wow. for them, yeah. for Adam and for Eve, or uh, Adam uh, and his wife uh, at this point. And then also we see in verse 4, look at um, chapter, uh, verse 1 of, of chapter 4. That's it. Mm -hmm. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, mm -hmm. and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now, mm -hmm. that's in the New King James Version. Mm -hmm. However, um, if we look at a, a translation, the NASB, that gives us a, a little bit clearer uh, view from the original language, it says, now the, man I had, now the man had relations to his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so there was a belief there it is. on the part of Adam and Eve there it is. that they thought that Cain was the fulfillment of the promise. Amen. Now, they would come to understand that he was not the fulfillment of the promise, but he was part of the process. Mm -hmm. And so they believed in Genesis Excellent. 3 and 15. Excellent. So I would submit that Adam and Eve were saved. Okay. And that's based on they followed the exact same pattern as us today, that we were found in a fallen state. Mm -hmm. God extended them grace, and they believed in they the believed. promise. They believed. Yes, sir. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, any any questions right now uh, from anybody on on uh, on the air? Okay, all right. Y'all want to y'all want to ask any one of those questions right now? Ah, yeah. I think early on someone asked the question: Do we pray for people who have already died? Um, to be honest, the, the Bible does not give us any indication at all that we pray for anyone who has died. Um, I think uh, Sean, would, Sean would, would know that more better from a historical standpoint that it, it, um, uh, at one point there was a, a, a belief system, if you will, still is. of purgatory, or yep. still is, whereby yep. uh, people can um, be prayed into a a good state with God, Sean. Explain sure. that a little bit Ab better. Absolutely, because I mean that's part of your uh, that's part of your background. Background, yes, yes please. absolutely. So um, I'm going to give you guys a little background, but turn in your Bible to Hebrews nine and twenty seven. Excellent. Hebrews nine and twenty seven. Um, but there was a there was a tradition that uh, had a belief, and they, they still continues on to this day that that there is a third place that someone can go after mm. death. Mm. So most religions believe that there is some type of eternal uh, heaven or there is some type of eternal hell, but there are a few traditions that believe that there is some type of middle ground mm. and it's called purgatory. Purgatory. And so purgatory is essentially you weren't bad enough to go to hell, but you weren't good enough to go to heaven. And so historically, um, there were uh, people that believed that you could pay money to have a priest mm. pray on your dead relative's behalf. Mm. And essentially, by paying enough money and by praying What they long call those indulgences. Indulgences, yeah. exactly. Indulgences. indulgences. So by praying long enough and hard enough over time, someone could get transitioned out of this uh, cosmic waiting room mm. for eternity. And so, um, yeah, yeah. So that's the that that's that's the the background of of certain traditions mm. praying for people that are dead. Uh, however, Hebrews nine and twenty seven is right. very very clear on this matter. Right. Uh, it reads on this fashion, uh, and inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. Mm -hmm. So. There is no bonus round. Correct. <laughs> there is no oh my. Um, oh do my. over. Do it now. Um, like, mm. the, like the soap opera, we have one life to live yeah. as far as uh, here on this earth. Yeah. And at the end of our earthly life, mm -hmm. based on whether or not 
we have uh, trusted in Jesus Christ and then we are judged by his works or we did not trust in Jesus Christ and therefore we are judged by our own works, that's it. So it is appointed to men to die once and then the judgment. So the judgment happens immediately. It just may not, we're still waiting for the gavel to drop, if you will, Amen. in the end times. Amen. You know, uh, uh, I guess an illustration of that could be in Luke 16. Yes. That uh, at verse 20 it says, but that was a certain, I'm sorry, that was, I'm going to start at verse 19, if you will, just for context. That was a certain rich man mm -hmm. who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But that was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gates, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abram's bosom. Uh, the rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me. <laughs> And send Lazarus uh, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, I remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. Besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, uh, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, and they may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Wow. Uh, and he said, no, Father, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said, if they do not heed Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead. My goodness. So basically what it's saying is that God has, a, has, a, uh, has put it in place that we got to respond to his word right now in life. Mm -hmm. We got to respond to what he desires for us right now in life because after this life is over, it's a settled issue. It's either eternity or it's eternal heaven or it's eternal hell. That's, that's it. Nothing else in between as Sean has so eloquently explained to us. And so if that's someone here today, if you haven't trusted in Jesus as your Savior, today is a good day to put your faith, your confidence, your trust in him uh, because we are reminded that there is a place of torment mm -hmm. that God has, uh, has, has prepared uh, for those who will not trust and believe him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. However, the good news is, is that God promises to give you eternal life uh, in heaven with him forever um, uh, escaping all of the wrath and disease and sickness and illness and all of those difficult things that we currently deal with in life. Uh, here's another question. Uh, in Hebrews 13, it says, Hebrews 13, I'm, I'm, let me read the question first. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 13, uh, when it speaks of the bedroom being undefiled, what does that mean practically? And can married couples use sex toys and practice role play? Mm -hmm. All right. Good, interesting question, interesting question. Hebrews chapter 13, I want to read that verse first uh, so that we can understand clearly what God is saying to us. He says in, in verse 10, I'm sorry, verse in verse uh, four. Uh, 4. Let me, I'm going to start at verse 1 just for context. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Boy, that's some plain language. Mm -hmm. That's plain language. So, so God has designed sexual union for only one place, mm -hmm. and that's marriage. That's mm -hmm. it. I know some of y'all want to tear that out of y'all Bible right now, but you can't. It's mm -hmm. in there, it's what God said, and it's very, very plain. So he says marriage is honorable uh, because why? It is designed by God, it's ordained by God. We go back all the way to Genesis uh, chapter, chapter 2, 
It is what God has put in place as it relates to marriage. Uh, and again, the bed undefiled, meaning again, it is not in any way, um, um, uh, there's nothing nasty about it. There's nothing uh, unrighteous about it. There's nothing uh, um, evil about it. There's nothing malicious about it. It's, 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 it's what God has designed. The marriage is honorable among, among all, and the bed now undefiled. Uh, but fornicators, he says, and adulterers, God will judge. And again, so what, he is, what we look at, what scripture teaches, is that any, any, any sexual intimacy outside of marriage is immoral. It doesn't matter how you put it. Um, it doesn't matter how, you try to, how we try to turn it. It is immoral, even to the point uh, when you would read in, 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 the, uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, he would tell us not to uncover the nakedness of a person. Um, uh, sometimes that doesn't necessarily have to be the, the sexual act itself, but just the fact that one would uncover, one would see, if you would, the, um, 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 uh, the, the genitals or whatever it may be of an individual, that in itself was an act of disobedience to God. That act in itself, because it was uncovering, quote unquote, a person's nakedness. So now, we talk about marriage. Um, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, that's the passage I want to turn to. Sean is getting ready to, he's going to deal with 5, 6, and 7. You can kind of see them all together, right, Sean? Mm -hmm. uh, 5, 6, and 7. Um, um, it, it says to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I love the passage. He says, now concerning things which you wrote to me. Uh, Paul um, had given, been, been given this letter uh, from the church at Corinth concerning, concerning issues that were going on in the church. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. That's what they were saying. They were, they were unbelievers, now they had become believers, and they were seeing, say, seeing sexual intimacy as dirty, as nasty, as a man should not touch a woman now that I am a Christian, now that I am a believer, now that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. He says, it, it, nevertheless, Paul says, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and, and if you read it, you read it in the original language, it literally says, let each man be having his own wife, and let each woman be having her own husband. And that word, be, the, the using the term be having there, is the, 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 the intimacy the actual sexual act itself uh, that is involved between a husband and a wife. Let the husband render to his wife the, the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Verse, verse 4, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So we talked about toys, talked about um, uh, uh, role playing and the like. Well, what the Bible, what the Bible pushes and what the Bible uh, uh, ordains, if you would, is the understanding that when there is love, uh, between a husband and a wife that go to Ephesians chapter 5. A husband is loving his wife as Christ loved the church. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, a woman is respecting her husband. Uh, understand this, that is an intimate, that is an intimate, that's why he says in Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. That is an intimate moment, an intimate transaction that's going on between a husband and a wife. Plain language. Anything else that's introduced into that relationship can become immorality. Anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, because if role playing uh, doesn't necessarily cause me to think about this individual, the, 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 the husband is not mm -hmm. thinking about the wife or the wife is not thinking about the husband, uh, sometimes the mind, Jesus would say, if you, if you look at a woman uh, uh, in, in the book of Matthew and lust after her, you mm -hmm. have already committed adultery. You've committed sexual immorality. 
So to include anything other than the intimacy of the act of a husband and a wife enjoying themselves, the pure love that he talks about in the book of Song of Solomon, that pure love that he talks about there, to introduce anything or anyone else into that relationship can literally become sexual immorality. Because that act now, uh, the, the act between a husband and a wife, if that individual's mind goes to anything else, goes to someone else, thinks about another person, it's now immorality because it's not the purity of the, the relationship that God originally designed for a husband and a wife. So, so the best way to handle that is he be say, he say be having each other. That's mm -hmm. bottom line. Be having each other. Don't, 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 uh, don't neglect the importance of the sexual relationship. Don't mm -hmm. neglect the importance of intimacy with your husband or with your wife because it can lead mm -hmm. to thinking about other things. It can mm -hmm. lead to lusting for other things. It's important mm -hmm. to, yeah, yeah, as, as, as he, and he said, the, the, and, and watch this. Render to each other the due affection. Mm -hmm. So it's not an issue of I don't feel like it. That, that, mm -hmm. that, that's really never, ever on the table. I think there comes a time, I think on, on, uh, we understand just, just the natural uh, issues that we deal with, with women, with ministration and things of that nature. That may happen within a month. But, but to, on an ongoing basis, you know, I'm tired, I ain't feeling it, all of that kind of stuff. God is saying that all of those things are the things that could lead to wanting to de do some things that needs to enhance our sexual relationship. The other thing is important to understand is the issue of romance prior to. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, just like, just like, just like we, 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 the things that we did when we were dating, uh, uh, E.V. Hill has gone on to be with the Lord. Yeah. Now, he used to have this saying, he said, the same thing it took to get your baby is the same thing you need to do to keep your baby. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> romance is an important thing. Doing yes. those things, those romantic things, those uh, writing a little letter, just, a, just saying to that person, I remember you. Um, uh, Marcia loves flowers. I don't really understand the whole thing about the flowers, but she loves flowers. Those are just things that you can do to make sure that you keep it fresh. Yes. Yes. As a single Christian, mm -hmm. is it appropriate to lose to use dating sites? Sure. I mean, I, I think this one is not necessarily a biblical question because, in okay. terms of the Bible, um, there is no concept of dating. Of dating in the Bible. There, the the Bible does not address uh, says you are either married or unmarried. Yeah. Um, so anything other than uh, your spouse is is the friend. So can you use the internet to meet friends? Yes. Okay. The question is not using the dating site itself. The question is, what are you doing during dating? That's it. That's the issue. That's the main issue. Yeah. So what uh, I, would question, I would question the questioner, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. as far as it's not the, it, it, the more important question is what are you doing during dating? Yeah. Again, which which is uh, just kind of a segue to the original question. Mm -hmm. Marriage is honorable among all mm -hmm. and the bed undefiled. If right. dating will lead to um, sexual intimacy, which has only been ordained by God in marriage, then using that site for that purpose right. is evil. Correct. Yeah, Plain it would be simple. evil. All right, here's the next question, mm -hmm. or the next questions. Mm -hmm. Why not fret thyself from evil doers? I like the way they answer that, mm -hmm. ask the question. Yeah. If you are being bullied, mistreated, or someone is always picking on you, why should we trust the Lord and do good? Why should we delight ourselves in the Lord? Mm -hmm. And we ask, we're asking all of those three questions that someone submitted. We're asking them all because all of them actually come out of the same, uh, the same book, yeah. the, same, the same chapter. Yeah. yeah John, and also we can even include question number eight. Question number eight, too. You're right. Yeah. Why should we commit our ways to the Lord and trust him exclusively? Excellent. Sure. You're right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can go to Psalm 37 to answer all four of these in one shot. Um, Psalm 37. And so 
Whenever you don't understand something, usually you can understand it in two ways. You did say Psalm 37, right? Psalm 37. Okay, excellent. Yeah, Psalm 37. Okay. okay. So usually when, when you find something that's difficult to understand, usually you're going to get help by keeping, uh, keep on reading or keep on living. Mm. And usually you're going to find the answer in one of those two ways. Okay. In this case, in Psalm 37, if we just keep on reading, mm -hmm. yes. we'll have the answer to these yes, questions. Yes, so sir. Psalm 37, do not fret because of evildoers. Do not be envious towards wrongdoers. And why should we not fret because of evildoers? For verse 2, for they will wither like the grass and fade like the green mm. herb. Mm. So that's, that's question 6. Or, or, um, that's uh, why, sh why shouldn't we fret? So number 5, I'm sorry. Why, we, why do we fret? Right. Now, as far as the, the question about if you are being bullied, mistreated, or someone is always picking on you, mm -hmm. So you've got to understand that if someone is, is bullying you, mistreating you, or is picking on you, so if we're looking at, the, at this from, a, from the perspective of someone that's attending school, you know, pre-K to 12th grade, you know, mm -hmm. type of situation, mm -hmm. um, if you're being bullied, mistreated, or someone is picking on you, then you've got to take into account, number one, that there's something that that person is trying to deal with in their life that's causing them to behave that way towards you. Most of the time, it's something that they don't have control over in their life that they're trying to exert control over you mm -hmm. in your life. The reason you should not fret is because um, if, if they are an evildoer, then they will ultimately experience punishment for how they treated you. Mm. Mm. And mm. That's, what, that's what verse 2 means. They will quickly, they will wither quickly like the grass. We, we so often, in our, especially right now in a, in, a, in, a, in a microwave, right now, um, immediate gratification, instant Absolutely. gratification yeah. society, we expect justice to happen swiftly. Right. But it doesn't always come that way. Amen. Amen. Sometimes the justice that comes for how you were treated may not come for days, weeks, months, mm. even years. Mm. So we have to have a, a wider perspective for, for justice and understand that there may be some things that someone mistreats you or bullies you. They may not see anything until the final judgment. Wow. Wow. That, that may not be rectified specifically until the final judgment. Wow. Um, but justice will be served. Yeah. Justice will be served. Um, also, for, uh, chapter uh, question number six, should we... Why should we trust in the Lord and do good? So <laughs> verse 3 in, say, in Psalm 37, yeah. trust in the Lord and do, good. and do good. Why? Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. So we're going to dwell amongst other people. We're going to dwell in our land. We have a, 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 a place uh, and a purpose that we're going to, that we're going to uh, have here on earth and that we should cultivate faithfulness. So we should do good to show ourselves faithful, mm -hmm. to show ourselves faithful. And uh, question number seven is why should we delight ourselves in the Lord? Uh, verse four, delight yourself in the Lord. And why should we do that? And he will give you the desires of your heart. Wow. Because it's about alignment. Mm -hmm. If I align myself with delighting the Lord, then I will be doing things according to his will, his word, and his way. And because of that, he will give the desires of my heart because wow. my, di my desires uh, align with his desires. Wow, wow, wow. And then also, uh, question number eight, why should we commit our ways to the Lord and trust him exclusively? Verse five, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him and he will do it. So why should we trust in the Lord and him exclusively? Is that number one, we have the Holy Spirit. So we've been, we, we are saved and sealed until the last day, mm -hmm. and there's nobody else that can do it. It says, and he will do it, and, will and do there's it. no one else who can or will. Who else would we trust in? You know, L Lord, where will we go? <laughs> you know, and so if we continue on uh, in, in verse 6, he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your wow. judgment as the noonday. Wow. Rest in the Lord. And wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Mm. So there's there there will be people that 
you look at right now and it seems like they're successful. It seems like they're prospering. Sure. But we've seen, I think, countless time and time again where people have had fame, they've had fortune, they've had followers, mm -hmm. and yet even all that was not enough. And some of them have gone to the point of even uh, ha being in such despair they've taken their own life. That's right. Um, because the fame, the fortune, the followers, the cash cars, condominiums, creature comforts, none of that amounts to anything if you don't have the ability to rest mm -hmm. in the Lord. Wow. Meaning that you wow. cast your burdens off of yourself and you can rest in, in his power to hold that burden for you that he's already done it. Yes, sir. And you have the faith that he has taken that burden off of you. Yes, sir. We're not we're not claiming it's easy. Oh no! But we are saying it is. We're able. Yes. And to know that, as, Sean, as, as, as Reverend Aguilar said, the fact that God has given us His Holy Spirit mm -hmm. says to us the issue that many times that I don't know about you all that I have is is I don't want to try what God said too long. I don't want to try it too long. It's like I'm willing to try it you know, two, three days, but if that thing don't work out two, three days, mm -hmm. you know, oh, shucks, I'm fixing to do, I'm finna do me now, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But but what we're learning is the issue of trust, the issue of, of delighting. It's not, it's not a matter of, of uh, uh, a sh it's not a short time thing, no, right, right, John? It's right, it's a marathon. I it's just got to keep doing it. Yeah. I just got to <laughs> keep doing it. Uh, but many times we can't find out what God will do because we give up. We give up, and we want to try it our way. I mean, I'm talking about, about, about me sometimes. Mm -hmm. I give up, and I want to try it my way, and then I get frustrated all over again. And, gra and I, just, I got greater frustration now because now God is trying to get me back to just where I need to be just to obey him. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so I deal with that frustration along with trying to whatever solve whatever that problem may be that I'm, uh, that I'm, uh, that I'm dealing with. Matthew chapter 5, someone did ask the question, and it started verse 38, it says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. And here it is. It's one of those pages you just want to take out the <laughs> Bible. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Somebody's already said, shoo. <laughs> ah. No, it's in the Bible. It's in the word of God. All I'm saying is, I keep saying it, we don't even give God a chance to see if what he says is going to work because we've already concluded, I'm not going to do this. You know, I so said, watch now. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks. And from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Again, what is he laying out for us? the kingdom of agenda. We pray it every day. Your kingdom come. Yes. Your will, will be done. Be done. Mm -hmm. The thing is, too many times, for what we're expecting is that we look at it from a standpoint, these things should never happen to me. Mm -hmm. Not me. Oh, no. Not me. Now, watch this. Here's, here's <laughs> the same one who said that, which is Jesus Christ, right? I'm, I'm turning right now to Mark chapter, chapter uh, 15. Um, uh, n notice, notice what it, what it, what it says. Mark chapter 15, I'm reading at verse 32. It says, let the, Christ, uh, let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may believe. Even those who were crucified with him, they did what? They reviled him. The Bible talks about the fact that, that when Jesus in his crucifixion, he had those, those Roman soldiers who slapped him. He, they slapped him. They, you know, the, the Bible says that they, they beat him. That's, mm -hmm. that's what they did to him. Uh, but what was his result? Uh, First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Uh, and it's gonna, I think it's verse 23. Uh, we're going to look at that verse. First Peter chapter 2 at verse 23. These are things that really help to identify us with Christ, but if we, don't, if we don't trust him, if we don't rely upon him, if we don't have confidence uh, in him, seeing him as our greatest example, then we're always going to do us, 
Notice what he says in verse 23. Uh, for context, let me, uh, let me start at verse, verse uh, 21. For to you, for to this you were called, because, watch, watch this, Christ also suffered for us, and ex leaving an example that you should follow his steps. Mm. Nor committed, watch this, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Verse 23, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself, watch this, to him who judges rightly, who himself bore our sins on his in his own body on the tree that we having died to sin might live right live for righteousness by whose stripes oh that we love to quote that one you were healed for you were like sheep going astray but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul so what God is saying to us uh, uh, does he mean does he does he literally mean uh, turn the cheek he literally means it but we will never know what he's going to do with it if we don't let it happen. That's the only way for me to say that. Because it's an issue of suffering. And it's an issue of suffering with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, listen, I'm not saying that a person, you don't defend yourself. I'm not saying uh, you, you're in a, in a difficult situation. You don't de I'm not saying that at all. But we're talking about a situation where Jesus puts himself allows himself to be placed in a helpless situation, in a helpless circumstance, and he allows them to treat him as bad as, he, as they possibly can, do the worst thing that they could possibly do to him. And I know what somebody's saying right now. My name ain't Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Well, according to scripture, he lives in you. <laughs> he abides in you. You, 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 you identify with with him, the fact that you are a child of God. But I'll go back to say, the reason many times we can't see what God will do in those situations is that we have already made up our mind we are not going to be obedient to this particular circumstance. In other mm -hmm. words, I do, I'll put up with some other things, but this one, I'm just not going to do. I'm, this is where I draw the line. And, and I've already made up my mind. So we can't find out what God will do through us, how he will bless us, uh, how he will mature us, how he'll grow us up, because we fail to trust him sometimes in those difficult cir circumstances. Mm -hmm. All right, please. Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, the, mm. the, we're not to subject ourselves to abuse. Okay. Um, so when you look at turning the other cheek and specifically also if you, this is also couched in that very, very same passage that talks about whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. The idea behind that is that in, in, in any territory that was controlled by Rome, you were compelled by law to carry the armor, uh, the gear of a Roman soldier for one mile if he asks you. Mm -hmm. Jesus here says, uh, if so, and whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Wow. Meaning to go above and beyond the call of duty um, because of uh, your responsibility, you know, to be a good citizen. But that is about going above and beyond, not necessarily turning yourself into a doormat or a punching bag. Correct. Bed. So that's Correct. not what it means in terms of uh, turning the other cheek, and that's how this particular packet passage sometimes can be abused. Right. So it's one thing if somebody does something to you, against you, and you uh, overlook a transgression. Yes. That's one thing. Overlooking a transgression um, covers a multitude of sins. Mm -hmm. However, if someone is physically abusing you, then there's no biblical 
support that I can find to stay in a, in, in some no. type of abusive no. relationship. No. If that's the direction that we're that Correct. we're talking about. Correct. Um, so there, there's by no, no means that we're to subject subject ourselves in in, in, time, in in terms of a relationship, mm -hmm. whether that's a romantic relationship, that's a yeah. a, a marriage relationship. That's well, you got uh, the example, uh, yeah. John. Don't, don't forget your point. Mm -hmm. You got the example of what Jesus says. You know, yeah. when you remember when they came to him and asked him, "Hey, what about divorce?" Right. He said, "Well, you know, where did that come from?" Mm -hmm. He said, "Because of the hardness of your heart." Correct. Moses, com he, he permitted, permitted divorce to mm -hmm. give that woman an out mm -hmm. from that bad situation. Mm -hmm. uh, we would say to give that man. So no, we'll never, we'll never condone and say to stay in a, but, but, but there, that's where you take advantage of what else God has ordained, government. Mm -hmm. Right, government. You know, so please. Go ahead. Absolutely. Okay. And so um, that's, that's really all I have to, okay. to say as far okay. as that point. Okay. Um, but just to the previous question, uh, before that question came in, um, just from a cultural context period, I did want to address the turning the other cheek because uh, there's a song that's out right now that's pretty popular. A lot of people have probably seen it on YouTube. It's, and the title is Try Jesus. Try Jesus, okay. Uh, and the implication is try Jesus and don't try me because I fight. Wow. And so, you know, <laughs> that may sound cute and, yeah. and funny. That's probably lighten up the group yeah. chats and, yeah. and all that stuff. And, and, and you know, it's one thing to laugh and kiki about, you know, something like that, but, but it's it's from a biblical standpoint, um, that is not how we're called to to Amen. behave and conduct Amen. ourselves Amen. Um, as Christians, because what that is saying is that uh, I can pick and choose um, uh, out of cafeteria Christianity that right. I'll believe what's convenient for me, and I want to believe for destiny season harvest favor right, i believe right, all that right but as soon as you mean to tell me that i have to have my life inconvenience mm. then i'm out mm. and so that's there's a there's a line there between we're going to have to endure suffering and how Amen. we endure suffering Amen. is outlined here um and and we're just going to have to deal with that in a healthy way but we shouldn't always be looking to, well, I'll believe this because it's convenient and beneficial <laughs> for me, yes. but I'm not going to believe this yes. because it causes me suffering. Yes. Yes. So uh, I think that we do have to have uh, a healthy balance, you know, uh, uh, there. But I just wanted to interject that just because with the turning the other cheek and right. this song coming out. Right. Um, so recently, I think that is on some people's uh, minds. How do we how do we view that biblically? Sure, sure, um, yeah. sure. Excellent. Any other questions? Okay. Wow. The question is, how do we know we're living in the end times as it relates to the Book of the Revelation? John, I'm going to start off by saying the church is still here. Church is still here. <laughs> well, that's the first. That's the first sign. The church is still church here. Church is still here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, now, again, um, yeah. are, you, are you in the Revelation, Sean? Yeah, I'm in. Uh, let, let me do this. I'm, let, before go we on. go there, I'm going to go to Second Thessalonians. Yeah. Or, or first Thessalonians. I'm sorry. First chapter five. Yeah. Uh, it, and it actually says it this way. Um, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren. Mm -hmm. You have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so come as a thief in, in the, the night. night. Mm -hmm. So anybody that can predict, that's trying to predict when he's coming back, I'm telling you, do like Forrest Gump, run. He <laughs> might as well run, because they're not telling you the truth, all right? <laughs> for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a, a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in the darkness, so that this day, we talk about the day of the Lord, that, that all of the prophets, literally all of the prophets talked about, should overtake you as a thief. In other words, though, though the day of the Lord is imminent, we know it could come at any time, it's not going to come necessarily as a surprise to us. And here's the reason. For you all are sons of light and sons of the day, for we are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who, who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith 
and of love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. And here's the reason why. Verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are also are doing. So God has already told us his return is imminent. The, the return of Jesus Christ is imminent. He's coming back. But we know that when it comes, that we're not going to be surprised because we understand that we're saved and God is not angry. God is not going to be demonstrating his anger toward us because we have trusted and put our faith and our confidence in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Mm -hmm. Go on to the book of the Revelation now. Yep. Go ahead, John. Actually, we'll make a stop uh, at 2 Thessalonians uh, cool. 2 before cool. we get into Revelation. Cool. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now, brethren, concerning the coming, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, mm. either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Mm. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first yeah. and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God uh. or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Amen. So again, until the rapture happens, that's going to be the big clue. That's it. That's the clue. That's going to be the big clue. That's the one. And, and uh, Pastor Ian, you said before you want to be a first rounder. First rounder. You want to be a first rounder. We want to be a first round draft. Any, any other first rounders? <laughs> and Raise so, your hand. Uh, that's, that's how you know. As long as the church is still here on earth, because uh, it says, again, it, you know, the day of the, uh, of, uh, will, the day will not come. And when it says the day, it's, it's capital D, meaning the day of the Lord. The day will not come unless the falling away comes first. So, uh, you know, the church has to be raptured. Then you, you start seeing uh, the stage being set for tribulation. Mm -hmm. The man of sin, uh, also known as the Antichrist, will be revealed, uh, who opposes and exalts himself, so on and so forth. Amen. So as long as the church is, is still here, until the rapture happens, until. we're not in the end That's time. it. That's it. Yeah. Just one more verse just to help us with that. Uh, in Matthew chapter 24, verse mm -hmm. 4. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you do not be troubled, that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, watch this, but the end is not yet. Mm -hmm. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine, here it is, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. Watch this. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. And you ask yourself the question, how long has this been going on? It has been going on as long as the church has been in existence. Mm -hmm. It's been going along as long as human humanity has been in existence. So the fact that we're dealing with COVID-19 right now is not an indication of the end times. Mm -hmm. The indication of the end times is when one day you're going to be, um, um, you know, recognizing it's a whole bunch of people that used to be here aren't here. If you still here, you can say, oh, good God Almighty, mm -hmm. we're in the end times. Mm -hmm. Because the church is going to be raptured, the church is going to be taken out. We who are followers of Jesus Christ, that's what I love so much about Jesus, y'all. Mm -hmm. That's what I love so much about God, is that he has paved every way. He has mm -hmm. made every promise and everything necessary to get us ultimately where he wants us to be in heaven. He's already dealt with all of those issues. So when we go through life now, the difficulties of life that we're dealing with, even the experiences that we're currently having, mm -hmm. it's an understanding that he has taken us through what he's taken us through. He's allowing us to go through it. He gives us his word. He gives us his Holy Spirit. He gives us pastors. He gives us teachers. He gives us members who can support us to help us through whatever kind of situation that we're going through. That when it comes to this particular time, we're not, we don't have to be alarmed by it because he's promising to us that we won't go through it, that wrath. Yeah. Maybe we've got time for one more question. You have another one? From Who 
who was the meekest man in the Bible? <laughs> who was the meekest man in the Bible? Well, I mean, um, obviously that, that would have to go to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, because well, if, if you other, look, let's say other than Jesus, other let's than Jesus. Do, do it because like that meekness, because we know. Right. So definitely. meekness, meekness is power under control. Surely. surely. So you got to look at who was someone that was very powerful, yeah. but control, but controlled themselves. Yes, sir. Yes, so, sir. Um, yeah, other than Jesus Christ, that's uh, pretty interesting. I think there's definitely a few people that could, they could be in the running for that. Okay. You got, you got the, the, uh, you remember the, um, uh, situation with Moses when, um, when, uh, he marries a woman of color. A woman of color. Ah! Mm -hmm. He marries this woman of color, and uh, Miriam and uh, Aaron get upset. Yes. And, and, and God said, hey, man, he's the meekest cat around. Mm -hmm. Moses is the meekest dude around. I mean, you're talking about, you talk about somebody who had a lot of power, yep. but that power was definitely under control, under control. That he didn't fight with them. He didn't fuss with them about the fact that he had married, quote, unquote, a black woman. Mm -hmm. that they were angry about, uh, but he showed meekness in that. Um, it, it was power under control, you know. So but I think there are, there are others that we can look at in Scripture, but, but I guess, you know, Moses is the one that kind of comes to mind for me. Any, anyone else, mm -hmm. Stefan? Anyone else? All right. Is there anywhere in the Bible where we can say, I think, well, Sean did, he answered that one. Remember that? Yeah. Where, the, where the enough is enough. Yeah. You know, I ain't going to take it no more. Mm -hmm. Because Christ is our example. Mm -hmm. um, Joseph becomes a wonderful example for us. Yes. Uh, from, a, from a human perspective. Yes. Job, Job becomes a wonderful human example for us. Um, um, of people who suffered. Jeremiah. 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 Fifty, literally fifty something years of ministry, mm -hmm. man. And and God had him to do some things that just Pastor would Wimpers. boggle the mind. Yeah. Boy, boy, if he'd tell us pastors to do that these days, oh my goodness. I ministry. think most of us would be turning in our license and man, I'm <laughs> done. I, enough is enough. I ain't putting up with on it. So so there's really nothing in scripture that tell us, quote unquote, enough is enough. Now if that question comes out of what Sean physical talked about, abuse, physical abuse, that's different. Yeah, yeah. I but think the everyday, the everyday, the everyday issues trials, of life. Yeah, the everyday issues of life. That's different. No, that's no. Some, sometimes we make ourselves martyrs in our minds yeah, over things yeah. that are everyday. Yeah, yeah. So I think that it comes down to again questioning the questioner. Yeah. Where is this question coming from? That's it. What level are sure, we dealing sure, with? Sure, sure, sure. I think the, the scripture says this to us, and we're going to close. He see tells us, "Be thou faithful." <laughs> even unto death. That's the, the, the command for us. Mm -hmm. Listen, folks, thank y'all so much for allowing us yes. to uh, come into your homes and, and to do it on, on this in this way, uh, in this manner of just still dealing with Scripture. It is our Bible study, if you would, for today. Uh, it is going to be available for us a little, a little bit later on for those of you that will. Uh, for those that do the conference call, it is recorded, so you can hear it again uh, anytime you choose to, uh, to listen to it. Uh, but we just, again, want to thank you so much for allowing us this privilege. This is going to be our last Bible study now until, I guess, the second week in September. And so we pray un until then, uh, let's not be lazy. Let's mm -hmm. not be complacent. Let's still be obedient to God. Be faithful, he mm -hmm. says, mm -hmm. even unto death. Father, how we love you. Thank you so much for your word that is always right. Your word that has no private human interpretation. Your word that's infallible, your word that's authoritative to our lives, your word that you said you've given us, but not just to be hearers of it, but to be doers of your word. And I pray for every person that asks questions, that for people that are listening today, that we will just make up in our own minds and in our hearts to serve you as our Lord, to know that you are the master of our lives and that we owe everything about us to you. Help us in the tough times. Help us in these times of coronavirus and COVID-19. Help us in these times when we're, we're absent from each other in bodily but spiritually, spirit. We still remember each other. We can still call each other. We can do Zooms and see each other. 
We can do drive-through visits where we can look upon one another but still maintain social distancing and wearing our masks. God, you've given us a lot of alternatives to still do what you've called for us to do as Christians. So we thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for Sean and ask that you continue to bless he, bless his ministry. Thank you for April, his wife, and, and for the, the ministry that you've given them together as a people of God. Thank you for Zacchaeus. Thank you for Stefan and helping us to make this presentation on today. For your glory and honor, we have done it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. Love you.